Hello, Honor Cypress and Physics students. Uh, so today we're going to be uh, finishing out a little bit about uh, torque and center of mass, and then we're going to be talking a little bit about rotational inertia. So this is a problem uh, that you might see. Uh, a meter stick has a mass of 124 grams, 124 gram meter stick. Its center of mass is at the 56.1 centimeter mark. It's not at the 50 centimeter mark because this is a real meter stick and uh, it's uh, it's not uniform. If the fulcrum is placed at the 64 centimeter mark, where should a 75 gram mass be hung for it to bounce? So this is definitely a problem where you're going to want to uh, put a, uh, or make a, a diagram, a drawing of this. Uh, and so we'll draw a meter stick and then uh, we'll put the uh, the center of mass at the uh, at the 56.1 centimeter mark we'll put our fulcrum at the 64 centimeter mark and then on the other side the question is where are we going to put our 75 gram mass so um, the first thing that uh, we're going to set up uh, basically an equation where the the clockwise torques equal the counterclockwise torques uh, so we're going to have uh, the uh, so this would be the uh, counterclockwise torque here. This would be the the, the weight from the uh, the center of gravity, the uh, the 75, uh, the 124 grams. I'm sorry, uh, and then uh, the the fulcrum is basically our equal sign, and then that's gonna uh, on the other side we're gonna have we need to find this distance. Where should it be hung? So we're gonna find this this uh, lever arm distance. <laughs> And then uh, we know that this is a 75 gram mass. Uh, where should it be hung? Um, so one thing when you're doing these types of problems, you can convert everything to meters from centimeters to meters, and you can convert grams to kilograms to newtons. But because I'm going to have centimeters on one side, I'm just going to have centimeters on the other side. It's an equation, so it just has to balance. Um, and I'm going to have uh, grams on one side and I'm going to have grams on the other side. The grams are going to cancel. Uh, you can convert both of them, but you're going to be basically uh, dividing both sides of the equation by a thousand uh, to get into uh, kilograms. What have you done? Well, basically nothing. So just, I mean, you, you, you can convert, but you don't really need to in these types of uh, situations. So uh, the first thing is to figure out our lever arm for our 124 gram. Uh, I probably should have put 124 grams on this arrow just to have it labeled. Um, and, and, uh, and that is the distance between the 64 centimeter fulcrum and the 56.1, uh, centimeter center of gravity. Uh, so my lever arm distance here is, uh, 7.9 centimeters. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to set my equation up. So this is my counterclockwise torque and this is equal to my clockwise torque. Um, it doesn't matter which I put on which side, except that I have to keep Everything that's counterclockwise has to be on the same side, and everything that's clockwise has got to be on the same side. The same side. I could have flipped this, flipped these two sides of the equations, and nothing would have, would have made a difference. Um, so our quote-unquote force, which is 124 grams, we're going to leave it in grams here, um, and times our lever arm distance, which is 7.9, okay, which we're going to leave in centimeters in this case, okay. Um, equals our 75 gram force, uh, quote unquote force, times our lever arm distance. Okay, so we're saying this side equals this side, just a balancing act. And we calculate that our uh, lever arm distance is equal to 13.1. Now that's not where it, where it should be hung at on the meter stick, that's just the lever arm distance. So we need to figure out where that needs to be hung if that's my lever arm distance. Well, the lever arm distance is the distance from the fulcrum which is 64 centimeters. So we're going to be 13.1 centimeters plus that. So we're going to put it at the 77.1 centimeter mark. So these problems can be a little, little challenging, but it definitely will help you if you draw and label a picture uh, and, and go from there. Okay. Uh, so Newton's first law of motion was that a, an object will only change its velocity uh, if a net force is applied. If there's no net force, it's going to keep moving at the same speed. Okay. Uh, there's also a Newton's first law of rotational motion. Okay. An object will only change its rotational velocity 
uh, or rotational speed, okay, if a, what causes a change in rotational speed? A net torque, okay. Balanced torques, meaning zero torques, don't change rotational speed, but a net torque will, uh, will uh, cause it to uh, change. So in other words, if there's no net torque, the object keeps what? Rotating at the same speed. And this is because objects have both uh, normal sort of linear uh, inertia. This is Newton's for, uh, law of inertia, as this often is, is called. Uh, and objects have rotational inertia. Uh, objects tend to keep spinning at the same speed unless there's a, a, a torque that causes it to change. So you can use this fact to, to figure out if an egg is hard-boiled or not. Okay. If you take two eggs, one you, you know is hard boiled and one you know is raw, okay, you can, you can do a little experiment. So, uh, take the, the raw egg, spin it on a table, okay, and then touch the top very briefly, just enough to stop it momentarily. So stop it for the briefest amount of time that you can. Uh, and then when you take your finger off, okay, it'll start rotating again. Okay. If you do the same thing to a hard-boiled egg, spin it, and then touch it briefly, um, it won't start rotating again. And the reason for this is um, when, you, when you're doing the raw egg, uh, when you get it spinning, you've got the gut spinning and the, and the shell spinning and everything is spinning. When you, when you stop the top, uh, the shell, okay, all you're doing is stopping the shell. You're not stopping the guts from spinning. Uh, so they're continuing to spin inside. Now, if you hold it long enough, it, you'll stop the guts from spinning too. That's why you have to stop it briefly. Um, but because the guts are still spinning, when you, you take your finger off, uh, the whole egg will start to rotate again. Uh, whereas if it's, the egg is hard boiled, if you stop the, the shell, you're stopping everything. So uh, once everything is stopped, it's not going to start rotating again. So a uh, simple trick, I use it here and there to uh, figure out if an egg is, is hard-boiled or not. So try it at home. Okay, so remember the, the property of, of mass to resist a change in motion is inertia. Okay, uh, and inertia, regular inertia, is due to the, uh, the object's mass. Okay, now objects have both a linear inertia and a rotational inertia, and we're going to be talking about rotational inertia today. Okay. So picture two uh, merry-go-rounds. One is full of, uh, you know, uh, big people. Uh, and the other one has just a little kid, or let's say is even empty. Um, picture yourself spinning a, a, a one full of people versus one that's, that's empty. Um, so if, if you were to try to get this, the, both of these to spin, it would be much easier to get the empty one uh, to spin than it would be to get the one that was chock full of people uh, to spin. And that's because the one that's got uh, chock full of people has more rotational inertia, as well as regular inertia, because it, it's got more mass. Okay. Uh, if they were both spinning really, really fast, it would also be a lot harder to stop the one that was full of people uh, versus the empty one uh, for the same reason. That's what inertia does. It doesn't want to change what it's doing. Okay. Um, so the more mass on a merry-go-round, the more it resists changing its rotational speed. And that's because it has more rotational inertia. So rotational inertia is the change to its rotational state, or it's the resistance to, uh, to rotational acceleration. Now, it doesn't depend on, our, as our previous example alluded to, it doesn't, or sort of, sort of alluded to, it doesn't depend just on how, how much the mass there is. Uh, it also depends on the location of the mass. And that's really where the difference between linear uh, inertia and rotational inertia comes into play, is the fact that it depends on the location. So um, if you try this, so stand up, all right, and then, um, and then stick one leg out and waggle it back and forth, fully extended, um, kind of waggle it back and forth, up and down or whatever, with your leg fully extended and then bend your knee and do the same thing, you'll see that it's easier to do it with your knee bent. And that's because with your knee bent, you've got less rotational inertia than you do when your leg is fully extended. Okay? Um, because you change the location of the mass. Okay? The further the mass is away from the pivot point, 
the more the rotational inertia. Okay, and this is a very important point. The further the mass is from the pivot point, the more rotational inertia. So here we've got two uh, seesaws with identical people on it. Uh, here we've got the people at the far ends, and here we've got the people uh, more towards the middle. Uh, which of these is going to have more rotational inertia, or would it be the same? Well, this is the pivot point here. Okay, uh, by moving the people further away from the pivot point. Okay, as we said, the further the mass is away from the pivot point. Uh, the more rotational inertia it has. So this is going to have more rotational inertia up here than it would down here. Okay. Um, so here this is an overhead view of, uh, of two merry-go-rounds. Uh, the, uh, the, the axis of rotation is the center, which is located in the middle, as indicated by the green dot. Okay. Which of these is going to have a greater rotational inertia? Okay. Well, it would be this one. The further the mass is away from the axis of rotation, the greater the rotational inertia. Okay, so which of these would be harder to get to spin, uh, spin up to a certain speed? It would be this one because it's got more inertia. It's going to be harder to change its rotational state. Okay, so it's going to be harder to spin up. It's also going to be harder to spin down. Okay. Um, so the rotational inertia also depends on the axis of rotation itself um, because that changing the axis of rotation changes how far the mass is away from the axis of rotation. Okay, so here I've got two identical sticks. Okay, one is being swung around about its middle. Okay, the other one is being swung around about one of its ends. Okay, which one of these is going to have the higher rotational inertia? Which one of these is going to have the mass further away from the axis of rotation? Okay. It's going to be this one, okay? Um, because uh, by spinning around, uh, around the ends, some of the mass is the full length of the stick away from the axis of rotation. This one, the furthest the mass gets away from the axis of rotation, is is half of the length of the of the stick. Okay, so this one uh, would have more rotational inertia. It'd be harder to, to change its rotational inertia or its rotational state. Okay, so uh, a baseball bat is harder to swing if you hold it from the end uh, and harder for it to slow down, which is why uh, sometimes you're told to choke up on the bat. Uh, you're, you're switching more to this state. Um, which gives the bat less rotational inertia, which makes it uh, easier to uh, to swing. Okay, so here we've got a tennis racket, um, and uh, the question is, which of these states um, has the the least rotational inertia? Okay, and then we'll look at which one has the most. So which one of these? So here, the tennis racket is being swung around around its middle. Okay. Here it's being swung around uh, by one of its ends, okay? And here it's being spun like if you had two hands on the handle and you were uh, moving your hands back and forth, kind of like uh, uh, you're trying to start, uh, like you were trying to rub your hands together, okay? So the, the rotational axis goes down through the, uh, the handle and all that. Okay. Um, The one that has the least rotational inertia is this one on the right, okay? Uh, because the axis of rotation runs through the, the middle of the object, and the furthest the, uh, the mass gets away is, from, is this part of a tennis racket, and all the heavy handle uh, is all along the axis of rotation. So this is, uh, has the mass the least far away, the closest to the rotational axis. Okay, the one that has the um, the uh, greatest rotational inertia is this one, okay, um, and um, that's because um, here we've got some of the mass is the full length of the way from the axis of rotation uh, versus this one, uh, the furthest we get is half the way, okay. So here we've got a uh, a disc, a, a, you know, kind of a wheel. Uh, and the question is, 
uh, which of these uh, disc uh, axes of rotation would be the, the easiest to rotate, which would have the least rotational inertia. Okay, spinning it like a record, okay, or, or holding it up and spinning it flat, back around and around. Okay. Well, on this record, uh, the mass is typically one radius away from the, the, uh, the axis of rotation. Okay. Uh, on this record, the max that the, uh, the mass gets is one radius away from the axis of rotation. Some of it's right on the axis of rotation. So here the mass is closer. Uh, so this is going to be the easier to rotate. It's going to have less rotational inertia. Uh, and this is going to be harder to rotate. It's got more rotational inertia. Okay. Um, so rotational inertia, the, the symbol in the equation for rotational inertia is I. I for inertia makes enough sense. Uh, the units on rotational inertia are kilogram meters squared. Okay. And as we've said before, the, uh, the, the, uh, at the rotational inertia depends on the shape of the object, uh, the mass, the amount of mass that's on it, uh, and the axis of rotation. Okay, so this is kind of a way of saying it, it, it depends on how far away the mass is from the axis of rotation. So here's some are some examples for the equations for uh, axis or for rotational inertia. Uh, and there's an equation that depends on how you're spinning it. So here we've got a hoop, okay, that's being spun like a record. Okay, and here we've got a hoop which we're spinning flat. This is like one of the examples that we did. And for a record, it's mr squared. Okay, but for spinning it flat, like we said, uh, it's one half mr squared. So it has half the rotational inertia. It's much smaller if you spin it flat. And we said it would be less if it was spun like this. Okay. Um, so here's some, uh, you don't have, oh, by the way, you don't have to memorize these. Uh, I'll give you these, uh, equations on the test if you're going to need to use them. Um, so here we've got, uh, some different rods. And, uh, so here we're spinning it. We're like, like the, um, uh, this is like the tennis racket that had the least inertia. Kind of like you put your, your hands, your palms on it, and then you rubbed your hands like you were trying to keep warm. Um, so, uh, and that has mr squared over 2. Okay, here's the, uh, the, the rod being spun about its middle, and that's ml. Okay, now here l is the length of the rod. In the previous examples, r was the radius. Okay, um, and then here if you spin it around one of its end, it's ml uh, squared over 3. So notice dividing by 3 is going to be bigger than dividing by 12. So if there's, this has a more, a greater rotational inertia. Okay. So what is the rotational inertia of a one kilogram cylinder that's two meters long being swung around its end and its middle? Okay. So the equation for spinning it around its end is ml squared over three. Okay. And the equation for spinning around its middle is ml squared over 12. Okay. So I equals ml squared over three. Okay, so 1 times 2 squared over 3 gives you 1.33. That's spinning around at its end. Okay, and spinning around its middle is ml squared divided by 12. Okay, and that's point zero zero point three three. So it's uh, much less, um, one fourth of, as a matter of fact, uh, spinning it around its middle. You know, because again, the mass in this case is closer to the axis of rotation. Okay, uh, and that's where we're going to end up um, for today.